Welcome, everyone, to this gathering hosted by the Unitarian Universalist Church of Bowling Green. We especially welcome those who are new and visiting, and for those who are online with us on Zoom or watching on YouTube. So we're so glad that you are joining us today. My name is Valerie Brown. I will be the service associate today. Just a little um, housekeeping, if you could turn your phones to silent so we can be present with each other during this service. We are a welcoming congregation. Whoever you are, however you identify, wherever you come from, and whoever you love, you are welcome here. Our Sunday services are different each week so that we can honor and learn from our wide array of traditions and beliefs. Today our speaker is Ken Kuhn, and I will read, uh, give an introduction a little later. Though we walk our own path here in this place on the land of the Osage, the Cherokee, and the Shawnee, and now at this time, we journey together as one community. For Unitarian Universalists, the flaming chalice is a symbol of the light of learning and the love of our community. This morning, our chalice will be lit by Aileen Arnold. As our congregation's chalice is lit, please light your own chalice at home if you have one. And then join us in singing hymn number 362, Rise Up, O Flame.
Well, we're going to start our, our service with a rousing song. We're, we're going to look, we're going to sing, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, number 188. And it's usually in a, in a round. Should we do a round? Michelle, do you? So we just, can we just continue until people drop? Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> That sounded so nice up here, just lovely. But I always wondered what a uh, lover of leaving meant. I don't know, but <laughs> oh, you know. I left some places up here. Okay, all right, got it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> this morning, our opening words will be read by Cheryl Stevens. Good morning. Someday, men and women will rise. They will reach the mountain peak. They will meet big and strong and free, ready to receive, to partake, and to bask in the golden rays of love. What fancy, what, imagine, what imagination, what poetic genius can foresee the potentialities of such a force in the life of men and women? Thank you, Cheryl. After that reading, we will take a few minutes for meditation, reflection, and prayer. The singing bowl will lead us into silence. After the silence, you're invited to join in the song, Spirit of Life. The words will be on the screen, but we will take about a minute of silence for ourselves to center.
please join me in a responsive reading. We'll be reading the words of Judy Chicago, number 464, in our gray hymnal. And then, and then all that has divided us will merge. And then compassion will be laid to power. And then softness will come to a world that is harsh and unkind. And then both men and women will be gentle. And then both women and men will be strong. And then all will be rich and free and varied. And then the greed of some will give way to the needs of the many. And then all will share equally in the earth's abundance. And then all will care for the sick and the weak and the old. And then all will nourish the young. And then all will live in harmony with each other and the earth. And then everywhere will be called Eden once again. As mentioned earlier, Unitarian Universalists have a wide array of beliefs, and the speakers at our Sunday services come from many traditions. Here to share his thoughts today is Ken Kuhn. Ken is a distinguished and professor emeritus from WKU, where he taught geology and had administrative roles, including head of the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies and director of the School of Professional Studies. He was also a faculty fellow in the WKU Women's Studies Program, and he is passionate about women's rights. Ken is currently in his sixth year serving on the Board of Directors for BRASS, a nonprofit which provides safe shelter and educational programs to the victims of domestic violence across the 10-county Barren River region. He is also very active in the Society for Lifelong Learning, a membership organization which offers educational opportunities for those 50 years and above in the Bowling Green area. Ken has been a member of our UU Church since 2008 and leads both the financial stewardship and buildings and ground teams. His personal life centers around his spouse, me. <laughs> I wish. Huh? <laughs> his two daughters and his two granddaughters. Ken? <laughs> Well, good morning. It's good to be here. I think I was looking back and the last time I spoke to this group was a year ago. And if I remember correctly, it was from the comfort of my own living room. And I may have been wearing pajamas at the time. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but it's, <laughs> it's good to be here. I do have a topic about uh, w women's rights and the women's movement today, so I'm extending the, the month of March a little bit here. But it occurred to me, you know, February we associate with uh, Black History Month, and March is 
Women's History Month and April is, I don't know. So I looked it up and you know, all of our months have these designations. So I looked up April, there must be something here. Uh, 42 designations. So uh, if you lift one thing up each day, you still won't get <laughs> you still won't get it all. Now these range from the very frivolous. Have you ever done this? Look, the, looked up these designations every day as well. Every single day, there's a calendar. You know that what's being honored that particular day. So we have some frivolous ones coming up in April. It is uh, well National Humor Month. That's good. It's also National Soft Pretzel Month. <laughs> And then we have some deadly serious topics. It's Child Abuse Awareness Month. Okay. And it's Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So let's keep those two things in mind as we move forward. My, my talk last year, we started out in, in Seneca Falls, which is a place that I'm very familiar with, in Seneca Falls, New York, which is honored today as the birthplace of the women's rights movement. And there in 18 and 48, a very unconventional convention was held. It was a convention that was organized and presented by women. Never had been done before. Well, women weren't bold enough to try that before. But they, they pulled that one off. It was uh, quite a success. It was written up by uh, Frederick Douglass as a big success, who was running a, a newspaper in Rochester, New York at the time. But the main product from that, uh, from that meeting was the inspiration of the Declaration of Sentiments. This was their document, and it was written in parallel to the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Sentiments, it contained a very famous line, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. And then they went on to list 18 grievances, the exact number of grievances we listed in the Declaration of Independence about why things aren't the way they should be, according to them. These were patriotic women. They shared the ideal of improving our new republic. They saw their mission as helping the Republic to keep its promise of better and more equal lives for all of its citizens, that was, that was the main thing. However, the reality uh, at the time was totally different. <laughs> Women were dependent upon men. They had no property rights. They could not inherit. A very limited em employment. Educational opportunities were not available. No college would accept a woman at that particular time. Uh, limited participation in the church. Certainly there weren't many women clergy, if any, at that time. Women did not speak in public. And when they tried, they were uh, met with ridicule and uh, vegetables, <laughs> literally, literally. Well, here are three uh, representations of our country, all female. These were used to pr promote the ideas and ideals of our country, freedom, liberty, democracy, equality. Well, can we sense a little smidge of irony here, if, if, if not uh, hypocrisy, that we, that we use women to represent these ideals? Yet these ideals are not available to women. The first part of my talk will, uh, will deal with how this symbology comes about, and then uh, we're going to zip up to the present and talk about some, some issues of the day. So let's see what happens here. Okay, here's a, here's a map from about uh, 1600. And of course, we we're want to name all the places that we know about. And this naming tradition goes back to uh, ancient times, of course. And when you want to honor a place, you name it after a god or a goddess, right? That's kind of how it flowed. And uh, land uh, was all, uh, associated from that time with uh, goddesses, with, with the females. Okay. We've all heard of... Uh, Terra Mater, Mother Earth, the Latin, Gaia, the Roman goddess of the earth, right? Let's start there. And the continents, same, same way. Uh, Britain, Britannia, was uh, a Roman goddess. Right? Well, uh, things got started to get a little sticky in 1492, <laughs> when the, the globe changed considerably with the uh, with Columbus, and he took off from Spain, 
and uh, wanted to go over here to India. It was a trip that could not be made by land at that time, so the idea was let's sail west and see what around this great ocean and see if we can get there that way, which he did, and he soon bumped into some land, which was down here, okay? He landed somewhere in the Bahamas, I guess, and uh, made three, four voyages I, uh, to the area, never stepped foot, you realize this, he never stepped foot in the, not what's now the United States. He got as far south as the island of Trinidad, never made it to South America, spent his time in the islands, looking for riches, finding none, uh, except very friendly uh, inhabitants of those islands. He thought, well, okay. He immediately seized 500 of those inhabitants and brought them back to Spain and said, well, I no gold, but here's, here's what I got. And uh, uh, the royalty in Spain said, wow, these people are our subjects. You can't enslave these people, <laughs> okay? So uh, Columbus' career went downhill from there. Okay. <laughs> now, the question is, how do we name this new landmass? Okay, and who named it? Who named the new landmass? Was it uh, the King of Spain? Was it Columbus? Was it our founding fathers? Answer, none of the above. It was actually uh, an obscure German theologian and geographer <laughs> who, who came, up, came up with the idea of America. And the reason he did was because there was an Italian explorer who followed Columbus, Amerigo Vespucci, who went back to those same islands, but then proceeded to explore the east coast of South America and name things down there. Actually, for some places they knew about in India, they still thought, you know, <laughs> well, they're still a little confused. Uh, but anyway, he, America is a uh, Latinization and feminization of Amerigo, the man's, the man's name. So this gave rise now to a fourth great landmass. The term America uh, applied to both North, South, and Central at that time. So we had the four continents. We had the North represented by Europe, the East represented by Asia, the South represented by Africa, and the New World was the Wild West, the Americas. Well, eventually, uh, <laughs> reality did win out because there is that uh, terra incognita, that unknown land to the south, Australia, Antarctica, you know. So the whole idea of the four corners of the earth or of the world, you've heard that expression, all four corners, that's where that comes from, the four main land masses, the north, south, east, and west, that corresponded to the, the cardinal directions on the globe. And it was very convenient because many things were square. Buildings are square, monuments are square, tables are square, and so you could depict the four corners on these objects. So what are you going to depict? Well, here they are. <laughs> okay. See if you could identify the, uh, the, the four continents there. It's kind of tough, but uh, they're all women. And uh, the, the one on the left is Africa, America, Asia, and uh, Europe, okay, in that order. Uh, Africa and America were, were somewhat unsettled and, and wild. The, uh, the goddesses here were sort of semi-clad. They uh, had spears and bows. They were surrounded by wild animals, serpents and strange. There's the flying monkey from the Wizard of Oz <laughs> right there. Well, nobody had been to these places, so, you know, that's, that's how they did it. And, uh, and Europe had the upper hand here because they're very regal, and crowns, you know, all kinds of religious iconography. That was the established old world, okay kind of thing. This uh, is a particular book, actually, that I'm uh, 
these come from, these were woodcuts. And uh, as I said, the concept of the four corners uh, was very popular. So for people who were carving and drawing and making these objects, this was kind of a, an iconography that was established for the four continents. And it sounds good, but it actually lasted all the way up to the uh, almost 1800. So 200 years, this, this is kind of going on. It got more and more elaborate, though, as, as uh, printing and uh, publication and coloring and so on but got more common. But it started to look like, started to look a little bit like this. In about 1730 or 1740, uh, a new representation started to take hold. And this grew out of England and the meetings of Parliament at the time. Uh, apparently, it was not a legal thing to publish the minutes of some of the goings on in the Parliament. So in order to get the message out, Clever Wags established a bunch of pseudonyms, a bunch of code names for different things. Okay. Instead of the Parliament, you had the Town Council of Lilliput. If you remember, Lilliput was the tiny people land in Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels, right? And America, <clears throat> became Columbia. So instead of referring to those annoying United Colonies of America, it was Columbia. And Columbia caught on, it caught on as a name. So people started referring to Columbia. This woman, a a uh, freed slave, an educated woman, is credited with actually giving Columbia a soul and representing the ideals of the United States. She wrote a very eloquent poem and she sent it to George Washington, picked up on it. And so she is transforming uh, Columbia from a simple name to a force that represented the American spirit and its people. So this was the first representation that was a whole person. So here's how uh, Columbia was depicted. A couple of different ways. On the left is more of the warrior defender type spirit. There's a, there's a crown involved, there's a shield involved. Right? Over here is the clad in the stars and stripes, the welcoming arms to the new country. Okay. Over the entire uh, 19th century, Columbia became more and more popular as a representation. Here she is confronting President Lincoln in the Civil War. Mr. Lincoln, give me back my 500,000 sons. Columbia demands her children. Here she is welcoming some German immigrants to the country. <clears throat> Women found Columbia to be both inspirational and aspirational and her popularity soared throughout the 19th century. They donned the garb and permitted themselves to be inhabited by Columbia's warrior spirit. And she became so popular that books were actually printed, little booklets, how-to, how-to booklets. If you're going to dress up as Columbia, here's what you wear, and here's how you act, right? So we're making the transition here from the allegorical to the real. And never was that more prominent than this very famous Women's Suffrage March, which was held in 1913, just before the uh, inauguration of President Wilson. And there she is in the flesh. So when you're going to have a march, you're going to do it as Columbia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Efforts to secure the vote on the national level began with a massive parade on March 3rd one day before the inauguration. 
the parade, which called for a constitutional amendment, featured 8,000 marchers, including nine bands, four mounted brigades, and 20 floats. And here's a little quote from an article. Though it appeared to be off to a good start, the route along Pennsylvania Avenue became choked with tens of thousands of spectators, mostly men in town for the inauguration. Policemen appeared to be either indifferent to the struggling paraders or sympathetic to the mob. Before the day was out, 100 marchers had been hospitalized. The mistreatment of the marchers amplified the event and the cause into a major news story and led to congressional hearings where after the DC superintendent of police lost his job. So here are a few pictures of this great march, our Capitol building. Here's Pennsylvania Avenue, kind of tough to get a march through that. Imagine 8,000 people in mounted brigades and then the tens of thousands of people in the crowd were mostly men that were traveled there for the inauguration event. And uh, they, they didn't exactly, uh, they weren't all exactly supporters, let's put it, put it that way. Okay, and here's another picture of Pennsylvania Avenue at the time. Well, little did the women know that it would take another seven years, uh, 1920, uh, before that uh, amendment. The 19th Amendment was, uh, was secured and the right to vote was achieved. So that was something that took a total of about 70 years time. Here's uh, Columbia during the First World War, asking people to enlist, asking people to plant uh, victory gardens and so on. But after World War I, Columbia fell out of favor. Perhaps it had something to do with uh, the rise of the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty, um, as an icon. Uh, and in the 19th century throughout, uh, sometimes uh, Columbia and Liberty were interchangeable, if not identical. Um, perhaps uh, the nation was tired and had something to do with this, uh, Columbia soldiering our way through World War I. But perhaps it was just time for these kinds of representations to, to go away. Um, as women became more emancipated. And you think about it, how can we represent a very complex and diverse situation today with a single image? What gender would that image be? What color would that image be? What symbols would that image be holding? And how could it possibly speak to all of us? Oh, that's our challenge, isn't it? That's why we're so, we're so fragmented today. Okay. Well, here's, the, here's our replacements, actually. <laughs> I'll just mention a couple, couple of things briefly. Uh, Uncle Sam on the left, this is the, the very famous poster that served both in World War I and World War II, uh, actually began after the War of 1812. Uncle Sam is a government man, right? He's not an everyman. He doesn't represent the people. He doesn't really represent the uh, ideals of the nation. He wants you, okay? That's how we use him. That's the government. So he's, he's one of our, he's, we want liberty, but we also got Uncle Sam, <laughs> okay? So careful about that. He actually began, he had a little different beginning uh, as an everyman kind of, kind of person modeled after somebody called Brother Jonathan and uh, other, other people, but this is what uh, he morphed into. And that was due to the uh, cartoonist and artist uh, Thomas Nast, who uh, he provided the beard and that, and that image Nast also provided us with other lasting images, which were um, Santa Claus, the jolly man in the red suit, and the uh, elephant and the donkey, which are associated with uh, uh, political parties. So those images have lasted over 100 years very, very successfully. Now, <clears throat> here Columbia is depicted still in the foreground with the statue uh, looming in, in the back. And uh, of course the statue was, was gifted to us by France and uh, you know it came with some political baggage. They wanted to kind of reward us uh, and, and also monumentalize their, their help in the American Revolution. But they were under a, a kind of an oppressive monarchy at the time. And they said, well, 
look, you had a hundred years of democracy, you survived the Civil War, we're gonna give you a statue. Okay, well, we didn't really want the statue. And, <laughs> uh, and then we had to put, uh, uh, make something to uh, put the statue on. The statue wound up 150 feet tall and it came in 300 boxes and then, uh, okay, you put it together. So uh, there was a whole fundraising effort of how to do that, and um, we had to get the base and the, this pedestal to hold the statue up. It took 10 years. So there's like a 20 year period between 19, 1865 and 1885 when this was kind of going on. So Libertas is also a goddess. So a Roman goddess that goes back to antiquity. So this is this is harking back to those to those days. Okay. We lost something, I think, when we switched from the foreground to the background, because as I showed you, Columbia was engaged with the issues of the day. She represented, she acted out, right? She acted up. She did all those things. She spoke up. She was in these political cartoons. Liberty just stands there. She's stoic. She's mute. She can't move. Right. Her connection to immigration uh, actually came from the very famous poem, The New Colossus, that was written by Emma Lazarus. She was an educated uh, person, and she was Jewish, and uh, she was uh, in tune with the plight of Jewish people, both in this country who were uh, being imported or exported and uh, living in squalor here, and um, she wrote those famous lines about give me your poor and, you know, all that, which is a plaque on the pedestal. Wasn't actually connected to the statue, so people were complaining about that. It's called the mother of exiles. But that, that all came from that poem, interesting, interestingly. Okay. The actual name of the statue, Liberty Enlightening the World. That's what the torch is about the enlightenment of democracy, okay. Okay, there it is. So this is the base, that's actually an old fort from the War of 1812, 11-pointed star. And all together, that's about another 150 feet, so it's 300 feet total. The women's movement has often been described as waves. A lot of people don't like that. It works, I think. From 1850 to 1920 was the first wave of women's rights. Once that right to vote was secured, so maybe our need for these types of representations went down a little bit, I'm not sure. But with every wave, there's a trough, right? And that's what kind of people object to. We don't pay any attention to what was happening in the background before everything came together to cause this wave to crest. The second wave was probably the one we're most engaged with from the 1950s up through the 1970s when you get all the issues of uh, women's rights and birth control, sexual revolution and those things. And that's called the second wave and today we're actually up in a fourth wave uh, of women's rights. Um, but I wonder what image comes to mind when you think of women's rights today? Is there an image? Is there a symbol associated? Can we grab on to anything? How about issues? Well, if we think about that, there's a lot of issues and that's part of the problem. This is so complex that is fragmentation. So people have their own favorite issues. There's not a unifying theme here that can go forward to cause this wave to crest. Well, that's no problem because we have an Equal Rights Amendment now, don't we? 
<laughs> oh, good, you're woke. Yeah. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. Okay. So you may know the long story there, but uh, just this past week, or March, end of March, marked the 50th year since that 27th Amendment was introduced in 1972. And you know what happened. There was an eight-year time period that it was approved and it had to be ratified by three-quarters of the states. Eight years to do that didn't happen. Got a big extension, didn't happen. Then, I think that was up to the 1980s, then uh, there was all sorts of court things starting to happen and the extension got extended and finally three more states came on board and we got the required number, right? Well then, okay, it's done. So everybody posed in front of the, the Capitol and said congratulations. Well then the lawsuits started happening because they were uh, uh, nitpicking about whether this was all legal and proper and it sort of fell to the National Archivist, whose job was to certify this and publish it. They sued, they sued him, <laughs> and it hasn't been certified and published yet. So maybe, you know, maybe we're getting close. I'm not sure. So second wave, still going on there. There's a, another thing to be aware of here, and that's the equal, um, the United Nations Convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. So the United Nations has been working on this since December of 1979. So far, uh, about 190 nations are involved. 180 have ratified and in, in implemented, implemented this. Uh, six don't want anything to do with it, and two nations are still thinking about it. One of those nations is Palau. I had to look that up in a book. I didn't read Palau is a tiny island nation in Micronesia, and the other is the United States. <laughs> so we have not yet ratified, ratified this. Well, the days of Columbia are behind us. Unfortunately, I think, there's a tremendous legacy that she's left when you think about it. There's about 30 cities in the United States that bear her name. There's a Columbia, Kentucky. There's a Columbia, Tennessee. There's a Columbia, Illinois, Indiana, et cetera. And there's also that place on the East Coast the District of Columbia, okay, slows everything down. Um, <laughs> we had for 200 years, Columbia, the gem of the ocean. Do you, are you familiar with that song? Did you think it referred to a ship? Columbia is the nation. We fancied ourselves as the gem of the ocean. Hail Columbia was a song. Still is a song. <laughs> it, was a, it, it was an unofficial national anthem. Our current national anthem didn't show up until 1930. So Hail Columbia and Columbia the Gem of the Ocean were two unofficial national anthems for us. Okay. We have hundreds and hundreds of geographic places and physical features in the, in the country named Columbia, Columbia Falls, Columbia River, Columbia Plateau, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Wow, what else? The beginning of motion pictures and recordings, Columbia Studios, right? Some of her history is recorded by the company that still holds the name, right? Well, except they're merged with Sony right now. <laughs> All right, I have to uh, skip ahead because I have gone way off script and taken <laughs> way too much time. So I want to get to the punchline here, and, and that is we can look at our own seven principles, which I call ideals because they are written that way. They're written like that Declaration of Independence. Right? That justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Think about this in the terms right now of the lens of women's rights, okay? The inherent worth and dignity of every person. Now, we believe in these, but if that's all we needed to do, we'd be a very 
lazy religion, wouldn't we? Sure, I believe in that. In fact, a billion people would believe in that more than that, but they're not Unitarian Universalists, are they? So these are general ideals that need to do more than have us believe. They need to inspire us. We, they need to be aspirational. They need to cause us to act. Okay. Think of them that way. Just the way Columbia brought it to life. We need to bring these to life as well. Look at the language, justice, equity, and compassion, acceptance of one another, use of the democratic process, world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Did you ever think about this as a very patriotic document? The national ideals are right here in our principles. Would it surprise you to learn that uh, the principles have undergone some revision in the past 30 years or so, and that those revisions were led by UU women? <laughs> Maybe not. So we'll be thinking about modifying these again. That's coming up soon, about adding an eighth principle, one that asks us to lift up uh, racism in particular. I have a little difficulty with that personally. Racism is horrible. Sexism is horrible. There are dozens and dozens of these institutionalized oppressions. Right? If everyone has inherent worth and dignity, then what oppresses one oppresses all. Should we lift one up or not? To think about that. Maybe we envision a world where we dismantle oppressions, where we create a global community that way. You know, something to think about. We might need some help. Again, I'll skip, uh, skip ahead a little bit here because I wanted to show you the modern incarnation is right here. Who is that? There you go. That's Wonder Woman. She's been with us for a few decades now, but I don't know if you've turned on the television lately. There are thunderbolts, automobiles, everything is flying through the air, people are flying through the air. This is the age of the superhero. Everybody under 35 years old is, is playing video games, watching superheroes, Columbia Films is rich, there's <laughs> these superhero franchises, right? So if we want to engage this next generation in women's issues, or in fact any of these other national issues, we better start speaking the language, okay? I said, well, this is crazy. I mean, can this, what's, what is there to all this stuff? You know, it's like reading comic books? I don't know. I Google up, do we really need our superheroes? Psychologists say, <laughs> yes, you bet we do. You can try it yourself. There's a lot of literature. Do we need our gods and goddesses? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. They're inherent to us. They're going to go back to antiquity. They have powers that are above us that we may need to invoke. And Wonder Woman has one very important tool. That thing in her hand, who knows it? <laughs> Kevin. It's the lasso of truth. Yeah. So here's a painting in the... Here's Wonder Woman poised above a city, which I fancy to be Washington, D.C. Please, Wonder Woman, encompass that city with your lasso of truth. <laughs> Elevate the spirit of Columbia and all her ideals. And so may it be. Thanks. Wasn't that an interesting, interesting lesson, talk? Thank you, Ken. We're, I was hoping we would have time for some questions or comments, and if we can keep them brief, maybe we can do that if anyone has a question or a comment or, yes. Ask me what, because it's not ratified. 
that it took five more decades for black women to get the vote. Yes. Oh. Ms. Michelle, did you? Got one over here. Uh, I was just going to say, I first found out about uh, Unitarianism when I was living in the Houston area in 88 and 89, and I was involved in a group that studied a course uh, called Cakes for the Queen of Heaven, which emphasizes the role of women in history and in spiritual, uh, you know, spirituality. I don't know if anybody here would be interested in that, but I just wanted to let you all know it was fascinating, and Ken, this was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Um, as part of our responsible search for truth and meeting, we encourage thoughtful discourse. And after the service um, in the fellowship hall, um, in the lobby, please continue the discussions and um, we will continue to learn from each other. We're going to move into the offertory. This congregation and the work we do is supported by the voluntary generosity of all who contribute. The offering is a sacrament of the free church. You may place your donation in the plates on either side of the door on your way out, or use the QR code on the screen, or donate um, via our website. As we enjoy the music, the offering will be given and received in grateful appreciation of our shared hopes and values.
We thank you for these gifts. May we use them wisely in the service of our congregation and our community. I'd like to take just a moment to thank our behind the scenes volunteers who made this service possible today. And Forrest, we always appreciate your music. Uh, I especially want to thank um, Janine Grossmeyer, who is hosting the uh, Zoom meeting today. Um, Diane Lewis for heading up the Sunday services group and, and giving us encouragement and directions all the way through. It's greatly appreciated. And Matt Hazel, our behind the scenes man who, who keeps all of this going. Okay. Um, are, is there any community news that um, we're aware of? Last week we had our first hospitality meeting and team meeting and there were um, eight people who showed up and are gonna be on the hospitality team. So if um, next week we'll have a sign up if anyone wants to learn to make coffee and, and be there to hand out snacks, get to choose the snacks. Um, next week we'll have a sign up for a few, a few empty spots. But um, Jeff Strong has um, volunteered to be head of that every week. Um, and um, Roxanne Spencer is helping today. So be sure and get coffee and snacks and have, feel free to chat with each other. And um, do read the weekly updates uh, when they come. Deanie. Yeah, this is just a, a wide community announcement that Earth Day celebration, which is held every year at uh, my house and Karen's house, is going to be Earth Day weekend, April 23rd and 24th. You all obviously and wonderfully are invited, and we will have directions sometime soon. Thank you. I've always enjoyed that when I've been able to attend. It's real, it's full of nature. Let's just put it that way. It's lovely. Okay, if you have questions about Unitarian Universalism or about joining this congregation, please speak to a member of our membership team. And um, we have Sharon Crawford and Aileen Arnold and Nancy Garrett here and Christina Kruger Great. And if anyone would um, like to be on the membership team, they could always use some help. They host a Getting to Know You You, which apparently was um, a great pleasure at the last meeting, was my um, report. Because of time, we are going to um, skip the last hymn, and we're going to close with a final reading that Cheryl will give us. This reading is called Commitment. People say, what is the sense of our small effort? They cannot see what, they cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time, one step at a time. A pebble cast into a pond causes ripples that spread in all directions. Each one of our thoughts, words, and deeds is like that. No one has a right to sit down and feel hopeless. There's just too much work to do. Thank you, Cheryl. We're now bid farewell to those who have joined us online. We hope you found this service meaningful and we invite you to join us again. Be well and go in peace. We have